Hello guys, how you going? My name's Sam from Core Electronics and today we're going to be taking a look at LEDs. That's right, all about LEDs. Now, LED stands for Light Emitting Diode and they're used everywhere, be it cars, computers, uh, laptops, space shuttles, command centers, uh, you name it, you know, torches, flashlights, toys. LEDs are everywhere and the reason is, is that they are so power efficient. They are a very efficient way of creating light. Now traditional uh, globes were quite power hungry uh, because along with outputting light they also produced heat and that is wasted energy. LEDs do not produce uh, that heat, nowhere near and draw such a small current and a standard LED will draw 20 milliamps. So very small devices, very cool. But we're gonna take a look today at what exactly are LEDs, how do they work, how can we use them, and how can we use them without destroying them because they're quite sensitive devices if used incorrectly. Now, there's a working principle behind LEDs and it's fairly straightforward. It uses a principle called uh, you know, electromagnetic energy, which is light, it's on the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, and there's a lot of lower level physics behind it, but simply put, an LED is a diode which operates as a PN junction. Now, a PN junction is a semiconductor, usually silicon, but it can also be other types, uh, that is doped. And doping means, it's not just cool, it's not dope, it is doped. Um, and this means that it is created specifically with either an absence or an abundance of electrons. And now electrons are negatively charged particles. I know, bear, bear with me here, some quick physics. Negatively charged particles, and those negatively charged particles are attracted to the positive side. So when there's an absence of electrons, there's what we call holes. You can see that in the, uh, the description here in the, in the article. And those, LED, uh, those electrons, sorry, are pulled towards the holes, and that creates uh, electric current flow. However, the electrons obviously don't want to go from the holes where there's an absence of electrons towards the where there's uh, less you know, less electrons because that you know they're not attracted that way. They go from positive to negative and negative to positive, not negative to negative. So that creates a bit of a one-way valve. Diodes are valves. They allow current to flow in one direction but not the other. That's an LED. Now there's there's a little bit more to it, but that's a quick overview. So a traditional LED that we know is a five millimeter, 10 millimeter, three millimeter LED, and it comes with two legs. Those are the two uh, the two leads of an LED. One is called the anode, and the other is called the cathode. Now the anode can be thought of as the positive leg, and the cathode as the negative leg, meaning that the cathode has to have a more positive voltage than the cathode. Um, so if, if this is all going you know, a bit confusing and a bit too much, check out our Analog Electronics Crash Course tutorial, uh, which covers off on basics such as what is voltage, resistance and current, uh, a bit of a more basic overview of what LEDs are and different components. But for now, let's assume you've read that uh, and we're going to press on. So that's an LED and there's, there's a small die inside this uh, epoxy, coloured epoxy case which contains the, uh, this PN junction. And unlike a regular diode which simply passes that current through, when, when a current is passed through this junction it emits light at a certain wavelength and the electromagnetic wavelength determines its colour. Uh, it's very, very cool. If it's more uh, has more energy in it, it's going to be more blue and if it has less energy in it, it's going to be more red. Very simple. So the blue LEDs generally will use uh, will use some a bit more electricity. However, we'll get to that in a minute. So how do we actually use the LEDs? We know a bit about them. We know how they're constructed, but how do we use them? Well, there's lots of different types of LEDs. You get digital LEDs, RGB LEDs, single color LEDs, diffused LEDs, surface mount LEDs, through hole LEDs, etc., etc. But the basic principle is the same. There's three main, uh, I guess. Uh, uh, specifications of the LEDs that you want to watch out for. Now, we'll go through those. First up we have the forward voltage. Forward voltage. Can you read that okay? Can you read my writing? Hopefully. It's all in the tutorial, but I'm gonna write it out anyway. So the forward voltage is the number of volts that the LED requires in order to light up at its full capacity. So most LEDs, the uh, forward voltage is between 1.7 and 3.3 volts. A blue LED is around, I think this one is actually around 2.8 volts. It's a little bit lower, but a red LED will have a lower forward voltage usually and a blue LED will be higher. 
There's lots of different colors of LEDs. Some of them are produced by having a different uh, different color epoxy. So it might just be a white LED that uh, has a blue epoxy around it. Blue LEDs are actually quite a recent invention. It was red and green that were a lot easier to produce. And that's why blue LEDs are slightly more expensive. They use slightly more complex manufacturing process. Whereas other LEDs are clear and the actual light emitted from the dye is red. So cool, we have a forward voltage. Now the forward voltage for this blue LED, let's say, is, uh, is 2.8 volts. 2.8, can you read that? Good. Now you also have the forward current. Now the forward current for any LED is usually going to be between 18 and 20 milliamps. So let's assume it's 20 milliamps, nice round number. Forward, don't mind my terrible writing here. Forward current is equal to 20 milliamps, which is also 0 0.02 of an amp. Cool. So they're the basic specifications of our LEDs. Now, how do we use them? Now, the LEDs aren't, they're not a smart device. Think of LEDs as a hungry dog. Sounds weird, but we'll get to it. Now, a dog, when it's hungry, likes dry food, and it will eat as much dry food as it possibly can. It doesn't know when to stop. It doesn't know when to say, oh, that's enough. It will eat until it is full, it is chockers. And then it will get really, really thirsty, and it'll drink lots of water, and its belly will get as tight as a drum, it may explode, no, probably not. Don't worry. Uh, but it's not good for it. It doesn't know when to stop. And an LED is a little bit similar in the fact that it doesn't know how much current it should draw, how much current is healthy for it. Uh, it'll just keep drawing as much current as available and destroy itself, which isn't good. Now, how do we limit this current? Well, we use resistors. Now, if you recall from our analog uh, crush course, I'm assuming you watched it and read it. Very good. Uh, Resistors resist the flow of current. They're a resistive load, which means you will experience a voltage drop across them, and they control the amount of current that is allowed to flow through the circuit. So we can use those because we need to control the current, and we can also use them to drop the remainder of the voltage. Well, we're not even using them. They will drop the remainder of the voltage. We just have to calculate how much, uh, you know, and how much current they're gonna, going to allow through. Now, again, if you've checked out our analog electronics crash course, you will know Ohm's law. For those of you who haven't, Ohm's law describes the relationship between voltage, current, and resistance. And it's given as V is equal to I times R, where I is current, R is obviously resistance, and V is volts. It's only R that's a little bit strange. Now, what we can do is we can use this equation to find the resistance required by an, uh, the resistor. We need to put the resistor in series with the LED so that it is limiting that current. Now, it's important to note that uh, the resistor can go on either side of the LED. For example, we could have a schematic that looks like this. Let's use five volts, so plus five volts. Now, we go down here on our merry way on our circuit. Can you see that? Yep, uh, and we have our LED. This is the schematic symbol for an LED. It's a diode with two small arrows indicating that it's giving off light. Current flows from this direction to this direction. So that would be positive and negative. Now we could put a resistor, oh, that's a terrible resistor, on the lower side of our LED and connect it to ground. That symbol there means ground. So we have five volts flowing through our LED. The resistor there is limiting the current and it goes there. Now we could control the five volt pin from an Arduino and when it's high, the LED would turn on and when it's low, it would not. Or we could control the low voltage because an LED, as we said, needs a voltage across it to turn on. So think of uh, the voltage across an LED as a ball on a slope. If you have a really steep slope and you put a ball down, the ball is going to roll very quickly. And as you lessen the slope, the ball will still roll, but slowly. Now, th that is like voltage. Voltage is the potential difference between two points. It can be thought of as the gradient of the circuit. Uh, now, if you have no volts across there, or the same voltage, so five volts minus five volts is zero, zero volts minus zero volts is zero, there's no difference between them. That's like a flat slope. And if you place a ball on it, it will not roll, it will not do anything. There's no energy there for it to work with. There's no potential energy. And that's all voltage is, is electrical potential energy. So we need a voltage difference. So if you turn, even if you put that ground pin to five volts, you're not gonna damage the LED. There's no reverse uh, voltage or reverse current going across it. It's simply not going to light up. We could also put the LED on the other side here, still limiting the current, still dropping the rest of that voltage in the circuit as we need it to. Now, anyway, that's where we can put the resistor. Now, how do we calculate the resistor's value? Well, it's, it's quite easy. We have the forward voltage required by the LED and the forward current. Now we know that in a circuit, uh, move that up, there we go. We know that in a circuit, the, if we're using five volts, so I've got an Arduino board here to demonstrate, which we can use the five volt output, uh, all five volts is going to be dropped between the five volt pin and the ground pin, 
which is why it's so dangerous to connect uh, the power supply directly to ground because it allows all that current flow, uh, current flow to go through. Um, but we're gonna use this resistor. So the forward voltage is 2.8 volts, which means that across the LED, uh, another 2.2 volts will be dropped. Fantastic. So we'll rearrange V equals IR to be R is equal to V divided by I. Our resistance is equal to voltage divided by current. Now let's fill this in. Now R is equal to 2.2 over I. Now we know that I, the current we want flowing through our circuit, is 0.02 amps or 20 milliamps. So we can again put in R is equal to 2.2 over 0.02. Now let's get our calculators or our phones in this case. Everyone knows that you always have a phone on hand. Um, can you see that there? Cool. We're going to put 2.2 divided by 0.02 into our equation. Hit equals and we get 110. And that means that R, the resistor uh, uh, that we're using in this circuit, must be greater than, the minimum value it can be is 110 ohms, because if it's any less, it's going to allow too much current through. Now, LEDs have a slightly uh, non-linear response curve to, uh, to voltage and current, which is cool because it means even if we use a 200 ohm resistor, you're going to, I doubt you'll see any difference between the 110 ohm resistor and the 200 ohm resistor in terms of brightness. But if you use a 1K or a 10 kilo ohm resistor, then you're really gonna notice that LED dimming down. So you don't wanna go lower than 110, but you can go higher than 110 and tend to limit the voltage there which is pretty cool. That's all there is to using an LED. Now, if you have multiple LEDs in different parts of the circuits, simply find out the value before and after the LED, find out how much, how much uh, voltage is going to drop in that part of the circuit and the required current, and you can calculate it. It's really cool. No more guesstimating LED values simply because you saw it somewhere. You can work it out for yourself now, and I think that's really cool. So that is how we protect the LED with current limiting resistor. And as I said, you can control the brightness with uh, that resistor, but what LEDs are not good at is uh, directly correlating a change in voltage to a change in brightness because they have that strange response. So how do we do this? Well, we use something called PWM, Pulse Width Modulation. We're not gonna go too far into uh, PWM today, but we're just gonna brush over how it affects the LED voltage. New page. Cool, 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 cool. All right, so. PWM is a square wave. Now, instead of simply turning the LED on from a microcontroller or turning it off, we do both. We turn it on and off really, really quickly, which means that things that are going faster than that, the human eye blurs out and averages the difference between those. So when we're blinking an LED on and off, you know, hundreds or even thousands of times per second, it sounds really quick. It's still very slow for a microcontroller clocking at uh, six, even 16 megahertz compared to, you know, the gigahertz that modern computers run at, it's turning on and off very, very quickly. Now what this looks like is a square wave. So let's say we have five volts here and we have zero volts here. It turns on and then it turns off and then it turns on again. Now if you looked at this with a high speed camera, you would indeed see the individual flickers, but to the human eye, what actually occurs is really, really cool. You see the brightness of the LED correlate as a representation of the on time versus the off time. This is called pulse width modulation. You're controlling the width or the duty cycle of a pulse. Now, the duty cycle, the frequency doesn't control the brightness. The frequency only needs to be high enough to be faster than the human eye. Uh, but the pulse width modulation, the duty cycle is what we're gonna be controlling. So if we have our on time as, uh, say this is the total time of one cycle. Now, if we have our on time as 75% of that and our off time as 25%, uh, the LED is going to show up and that goes on and on and on. Um, the LED is going to display at approximately 75% brightness. Likewise, if here is our total cycle. We have it high for 25% of the time, low for 25% of the time, and then on and on. It will appear at 25% brightness because the human eye is averaging those changes. It says, oh, well, it's off for less time than is on. Uh, it's about that bright. Fantastic. Not that simple, but that's my explanation of it. And it's really, really cool. So that's how we can use pulse width modulation to control the brightness of an LED. Now, what's that I hear you ask? Multiple LEDs in a circuit? <gasps> no, yes. Now, there's a little bit of a misunderstanding with this and it just comes down to the lack of understanding between a basic type of circuit, be it series or parallel. Now in series, 
uh, you might have heard serial data before, and that refers to the fact that information is sent one bit after the other in serial. There's not multiple lines, it's not running in parallel channels, it's just one line. And the same can be said of LEDs. You might have had a set of Christmas lights. Christmas lights are a great example. Everyone has that set of Christmas lights where once it was working and now it's not. And perhaps your dad in all of his infinite wisdom went around checking each individual LED, trying to spare out to see which one works. And that's because the LEDs were connected in series. You had one LED going into another LED, excusing the lack of arrows or current limiting resistors, going into one LED and so on and so forth. And that was your chain of LEDs. Now, if one LED uh, breaks or is damaged for some reason, it's going to not allow the current flow through that. And suddenly you've got a broken circuit. Every LED will go out, which sucks. So now modern Christmas lights use parallel circuits. Now, what this means is that if this is your five volt line and this is your zero volt line or ground, Right. They're the power lines. You have an LED going between 5 volts and ground with its poorly drawn resistor there. And then you have another one in parallel to it, which is very cool. Now this allows uh, as much current to flow through each individual circuit branch as the resistor will allow. And it allows each LED to have its own path. So if one goes down, that LED still has a path from 5 volts to ground. It's really cool. Now, the big reason, along with you know the uh, testing of a broken LED, is that with uh, LEDs in series, you know how there's a there's a voltage drop across the LED. So with the blue LED we just used, it was about 2.8 volts. Well, that means, say you start off with 12 volts. This LED has 12 volts to work with. It drops 2.8 volts. The next LED gets the remainder of that, so it doesn't get all 12 volts. It only gets uh, what 9.2 volts and so on and so forth until the LEDs no longer have any voltage left to work with. Um, this appears as one LED being brighter, then slightly less bright, slightly less bright, and dimmer and dimmer and dimmer and dimmer, dimmer, which isn't the ideal effect. In parallel, they get their equal share of the voltage rail, um, and they all glow at uniform brightness, or however the resistor is set. Really cool. So if you're wanting to use LEDs in or multiple LEDs in a circuit, that's how you go about it. The resistors are calculated the exact same way. So no fear. Now, the last thing we're gonna cover off on is two different unique types of LEDs. And these are RGB LEDs, which we mentioned earlier, and digital LEDs. Now, I've got an RGB LED here. I'm not sure how well you can see that. But it's a single LED package, and you'll notice that there's actually four uh, legs coming off it. And that means that inside that epoxy package, there's three individual dyes of the diodes inside that, each with its own control leg. So what this would look like is you would have one LED, two LEDs, three LEDs. One would be red, one would be green, and the other would be blue, R, G, B. And these would have individual pins, all right? Now you can get common cathode LEDs, uh, RGB LEDs, which means that the, uh, the cathode pins here, the negative pins, are all connected up, and you would connect that to ground, perhaps through uh, with a resi uh, resistor on the other side. So you connect that to ground and have your control pins here, individual resistors, uh, and away you go. You can also have common anode uh, LEDs, which are simply the opposite. Now that's very cool. Now the other thing you have, that's RGB LEDs, very simple, is digital LEDs. Now these are incredibly cool. You might know there's NeoPixels or Dot Stars, uh, Adafruit's brand names for those. And they're just a digital chip on board which can accept serial data and then control the LEDs. And the cool thing about those is, is that you can control hundreds of the things with just two control wires for all of the LEDs. Very, very cool. What a world we live in, digital LEDs. There's individual tutorials on both NeoPixels and Dot Stars. So check those out, we go into more detail there. Um, that is a quick rundown all about LEDs. Hope you learned something new today, guys, and you can take these principles and get a better understanding of what's going on in your circuit, rather than just guessing at what's going on, not really understanding the fundamentals behind it. It's not that complicated. Have a go, practice some equations on your own. Um, I'm Sam, hope you learned something new today, guys, and I will see you next time.